Today's show is all about pizza, and I always look for a thin crust, brown all over the bottom, and beautifully crusty on top. Today we have joining us three students. So nice to have you here. And all three of our students are from the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Daniela, where are you from? I'm from Miami, Florida. And Catherine, where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. You are, and Chase. And I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. Ah, hotbed of good cuisine. Fantastic. Yeah, food. wonderful. Very nice to have you all here. And have you all made pizza at home? And yes. pizza dough. So ask questions, make comments, interrogate, explicate, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> it's more fun to have you talking to me than just sitting there, okay? Great. All right. We're going to be making a delicious spinach pizza with three cheeses. The dough that we make was inspired by a really fine Italian chef. He has an amazing restaurant and his pizza is second to none. This is an adaptation of his pizza recipe. He never gave me the real recipe. We just had to try everything. You know, tried it about a hundred times before we got <laughs> something akin to his pizza. So two cups of warm water, one package of active dry yeast. Let this proof and you can make the dough right on your counter. Start with three cups of all-purpose flour. You're going to use five cups altogether, and two teaspoons of fine sea salt. Mix this all together. You can use a whisk if you want or just your fingers, but try to get the salt throughout the flour. I like this method because it's, you know, using your hands. It's uh, the artisanal pizza is alive and well everywhere. Everybody's making it. In my neighborhood here, we have a pizza truck that comes with an oven in the truck. A very nice business for my friend. And he makes pizzas to order right in your own backyard. So you can have him come, serve at parties. It's so delightful. So uh, here we have our yeast. Let's give it a stir. Martha, do you prefer to use the dry yeast over the fresh? Well, it's so readily available, and most people can get the dry yeast in the supermarket. Right. You can use cake yeast, no problem, if you can get it. We can find it here only in bakeries. Right. Right. Remember, I live in the boondocks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just making my well with our water, and I start by using a fork to go around, it's sort of like I make my pasta dough. And then I'll add the rest of the liquid hopefully without breaking the well. And this is all only to save time washing a bowl. You can do it in a bowl very easily. Do you have any tips or advice for somebody who's maybe not so used to working with bread or yeast, or yeast? product? Your yeast should be proofed in water no hotter than 115 degrees. And yeast is a substance that reacts with the starch or sugar to form a alcohol and carbon dioxide, which gives you the airiness, the rise of the dough, the ultimate dough. So you want to not kill it by hot water. So here we are, almost ready to start the kneading process. What are some of the other methods you could use to make the pizza dough? Well, the fastest way is in a stand mixer with a dough hook. <laughs> we just wanted to do something a little bit fun. A lot of people don't have a stand mixer, and I just want to make the recipes as accessible and as useful to as large an audience as possible. When people ask me the tools that I must have in the kitchen, I always say a stand mixer, food processor, a good set of pots and pans, and a good set of knives, and a good counter to work on. So you see how nice this is becoming? So a lot of people ask how to knead. I'm using basically my, the heels of my hands, not my fingers as much, even though they're completely covered with dough. Um, and I'm pressing, pulling the top toward me and then pushing the bottom away. Pulling, pushing. Is there anything you're looking for texture-wise while you yes, do this? Yes, a baby's bottom. <laughs> okay. I can feel it becoming elastic. The gluten has to relax, so it's going to rise in an oiled bowl for about two hours prior to putting it in the refrigerator overnight. And why do you let it sit in the refrigerator overnight? It's resting. It's making a finer, more tender dough. And it gives you time to get all your toppings and fillings ready for your big pizza party that you're going to have on Friday night. <laughs> so now this is rested for two hours at room temperature, and we're going to cut this into four 
equal pieces. Just use your bench scraper to do that. And these will be your crusts, enough for a sizable calzone, enough for a 12 inch pizza, or enough for a skillet pizza, which has a little bit thicker crust. This is a method that I learned making pistolet or French boule. And you just pinch the bottom until you get a nice smooth top and put that on a well floured baking sheet. This is what's going to go into the refrigerator overnight to rest the gluten, ferment the yeast a little bit, and make a more flavorful dough. Okay, so here we have our dough. It's looking really good. And this is what you want to form into your base for your pizza. 12 inches round. I'm working on a piece of parchment paper. This really simplifies a lot of problems for people who haven't made pizza before. Because we have a stone in the oven heating to 550 degrees. That stone is piping hot and it will cook a pizza in approximately 10 minutes. So this is very nice. No need to fling the pizza up into the air unless you are adept and expert. I've had it stick to the ceiling. <laughs> so just keep stretching the dough to get to the desired diameter of 12 inches circumference. I don't know, I'm sorry, I froze. Pi D. Okay, beautiful. It's flat and even and looking good. Now the topping is delicious. We have Gruyere cheese grated. Sprinkle that all over your top. Now you can leave about a quarter of an inch around the edge if you want a nice edge. We also have mozzarella, fresh buffalo mozzarella. This uh, lovely mozzarella melts beautifully in the oven. The pecorino is a salty cheese adding a lot of flavor. And the Gruyere just gets nice and stringy. And it's also very flavorful. Uh, we also have a couple garlic cloves that are slivered. You can put a garlic sliver here and there. And then I think we'll do the spinach. These are washed baby spinach leaves, which go on last. And at the end, we're going to put some mint leaves on. They go so well with the uh, spinach. And now a sprinkling of black pepper. A sprinkling of red pepper flakes would be nice too. Some salt and a drizzle of olive oil. This helps the spinach cook without burning. And this is a peel. This helps a lot to get your pizza in and out of the oven. So right into the oven. Now take your peel all the way to the back of the stone and then just gradually slide this off positioning it in the middle of the stone. Set your timer for 10 minutes. It's time to get the pizza out of the oven. It is exactly 10 minutes. Oh, that looks so amazing. Now that looks like it comes from the best restaurant, doesn't it? So just slide this right off onto your cutting board. Don't use this as a cutting board. It's really uh, needs to stay nice and smooth. And there you have an amazing pizza to just add a little more flavor. A few pieces of mint leaf. You'll like the taste of the mint with the spinach. It is really delicious and it really does enhance the pizza. Now you can cut with a mezzaluna like this. I guess I'll make eight pieces. I'll have to practice if I'm going to work in my own pizza parlor. <laughs> Serve this piping hot with some pieces of lemon. I just have to show you underneath. The crust is a beautiful color, just like you'd find at your own pizzeria. Have a piece, guys. Please, Please help you yourselves. Me. Let me know what you think. Pretty good, right? It's really good. It's delicious. <laughs> Mm, so good. Another use for that delicious pizza dough is calzone. Calzone are filled pizza dough pouches roasted in a hot oven and the fillings actually are endless. My favorite right now at this moment, roasted pepper, tomato, onion, and sausage. 
Does that sound good to you, students? Sounds fantastic. Yes, and the dough works so well as a calzone. So what I'm doing right now is roasting my peppers. I do them right over a gas flame. And my method is blacken the skin completely. And then I neatly envelop the pepper with a paper towel like that. And I let it kind of perspire. You'd be perspiring if you were roasted like that too, I think. So, <laughs> so let that sit. Another way is to just put the peppers in a bowl and cover tightly with plastic wrap and let them sweat that way. Is there any good way to do that if you don't have a gas stove? Or... Yeah, you could put it under the broiler. It's so right. easy. Yeah. Just keep turning it, blacken it. Most electric stoves have broilers. Right. So put the pan right under. That, that will help you a lot. Now, first thing for the filling is to brown the sausage. This is three quarters of a pound of Italian sausage. And if you've bought the Italian sausage in casings, take the casings away. I like to add a little tiny bit of olive oil to the pan. So break up the sausage meat a little bit and cook it just till it's lightly browned. This is enough filling for about four healthy sized calzones. Calzone in Italian means trouser or stocking. If you're gonna have pizza night at your house, what could be better than pizza, calzone, skillet pizza? It's a lot of fun. And now we have some roasted red pepper already cut up into cubes. We have one garlic clove, very, very finely minced. That's for our filling. And we need a yellow pepper. Now watch my method of peeling is just to rub the skin right off in the paper towel. And this really does take off all the skin and makes virtually little or no mess. And you can deal with a hot pepper too. A lot of people put these under running water and I just don't like to do that. It takes away so much of the flavor. So don't be tempted. <laughs> Chase, you wanna um, check the sausage? Here, just give it a stir. And you can cut the pepper in half. What you wanna do is remove all the seeds, the core. I think we're just about there. That is, oh good. This looks good. All right. This can go right into this little bowl. Mmm, yummy. Now into the pork fat, put your onions. And this is one large white onion, peeled and diced. You could just stir that too. You're very helpful. So now I'm cutting the yellow peppers into quarter inch cubes to match the red peppers. And these roasted peppers are so much tastier than if you just put in uncooked bell peppers. This really adds to the flavor of the entire filling. And by roasting too, you eliminate a lot of the moisture from the pepper. So here we have the yellow pepper, the red pepper, one of each. This would be a great, great sauce for pasta too. It doesn't have to go into a calzone. This is finished. How are you doing, Chase? I think we're ready over here. Okay, so now we Double can check add. me. <laughs> huh? Yeah, we can add now the tomato sauce. All right. There. We can add our garlic. We could add our peppers. If it's too hot, just adjust it a little bit. Really stir that around. Oh, some salt and pepper. And then we'll add our sausage. And that is our filling for our calzone. It really helps a lot to have somebody like Chase in the kitchen. Okay, so now to form your calzone. Here is our refrigerated dough right onto a piece of parchment paper. If you need a little flour, put it on your fingertips and basically push it out to a 12 inch round. You can also do it this way, which I prefer. And you can use your fingertips like this, pull all the way to the edge just to thin out your dough and make a approximately a 12 inch circle. That looks good. No holes because you don't want your filling leaking out all over your parchment paper. And a leaky calzone just isn't so pretty. So here, I think our filling is cool enough. This is enough for four calzone. Put it right in this middle. That looks so good. Some beautiful fresh buffalo mozzarella. A couple ounces. Some salt 
a little bit more black pepper. And now fold this in half. And remember, these fillings can be anything you choose. Every calzone chef has a different edge. You can turn it like this. Notice I've sealed the edge first, then I'm twisting it over to make a pretty little edge. And just kind of even out, you can feel the filling in there. And this goes right into your 550 degree oven, if your oven goes that high. I'm just going to tear this paper off like that, right onto your hot pizza stone, and right into your hot oven. There it goes. Set your timer for 15 minutes. I think our calzone is ready, 15 minutes on the dot. Let's see what it looks like. Oh my gosh, how beautiful. <gasps> well, now I hope I can just lift this onto the peel, which I did. There, what do you think? I think it looks really good. Students, what do you think? It looks amazing. Pretty fabulous, right? <laughs> Most definitely. Don't cut it when it's this hot. Just wait a little bit because it is very hot. You can make calzones with so many different fillings. Try this one though, I know you will like it. For those of you who don't have a pizza stone, just pull out your cast iron skillet. It works very well as the vehicle for a delicious pizza. And this one's gonna to be topped with wild mushrooms. So three tablespoons of unsalted butter, melt that, and saute a half a cup of very finely minced shallot. Shallot goes very nicely with mushrooms. And now I'm using an assortment of wild mushrooms. We have oyster mushrooms. What kind? Shiitake. Shiitake mushrooms. Oh, and by the way, cut the stems out of the shiitakes. Save them for stock. They're just a little too tough for a filling like this. You spend your whole day chewing them. Uh, a nice cremini mushroom. And these are a strange little mushroom. These are delicious in Japanese soup. They're called a beach mushroom. And they're very sweet. And just roughly chop the mushrooms and make sure that they are clean. I remember my mother saying, oh, never, never wash a mushroom. You'll lose all the flavor. But uh, I've actually gotten into the habit of washing and then uh, drying on a towel. And it works very well. You don't lose the flavor. So this is the oyster mushrooms and the shiitakes. So many different kinds of mushrooms. If you are lucky, you can find portobello's, porcini. Just don't use an amanita. Do you know what those are? Yeah. The deadliest of all mushrooms. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> chanterelle are excellent. I have a uh, place up in Maine, and we have beautiful chanterelle mushrooms growing in the woods, September, October, even in August. So I think our shallots probably are ready to take some of these mushrooms. I'll put these in. But you see, not too, not too fine. And these are beach mushrooms. Little delicate. They look a little bit like inaki mushrooms. Inakis are a little skinnier stem, very watery white mushroom. These have a little bit more body to them. Do you want me to give those a stir while you're... Yeah, please, help me. <laughs> you got it. Now of all these mushrooms, these are by far the toughest. These brown cremini, which are a brown version of the white button mushroom. Do you look for anything specific when you're picking or buying your mushrooms? Yes, um, always look for a stem that's tight to the cap in a cremini or a white mushroom or a portobello. It's important to uh, get the very, very freshest mushrooms. Now also have on hand a half a cup of white wine, three quarters of a cup of heavy cream, and salt and pepper. The salt will help bring out the moisture in the mushrooms. And now I'll add the rest of the mushrooms. So it looks like a lot, but they actually do cook down. So just get them exuding their moisture, and then we'll add the white wine. Could you substitute the wine out altogether? You could use stock, no problem, like a chicken stock or a beef stock. But the wine is such a nice flavor with the mushrooms. So these are just starting to really cook. I'm gonna add the white wine and evaporate as much of it as possible to just keep the flavor. 
Do you think that making the pizza in the skillet versus on the stone in the oven affects the flavor in any way? It's a little different. And the crust is a little thicker. So now this is dry enough to pour the heavy cream in. You just stir this in. You don't want to really reduce the cream. You just want to bring it to a boil. That does look good. And this is enough topping for four lovely mushroom skillet pizzas. If you add some mozzarella cheese, you could use this for a calzone also. How delicious that would be. So now, to cool this mushroom filling, you can just put it into a shallow dish like this. Let that cool. Mm, so pretty. And now our pizza. This is our iron skillet. It's an eight inch skillet. You can make the dough into about nine inches, pull it up around the edge. Why is a cast iron skillet better than any of the other? Well, things? it's totally oven proof, first of all. They're making beautiful cast iron now, lightweight cast iron. Have you seen the new, the new Japanese pieces? Oh, yeah. so beautiful. A cast iron pan at home, it's about what feels like 80 pounds mm -hmm. and you can't hardly. Was it grandma's? Yeah. Yep. Well, so. I have my mom's. I have all my mom's cast iron. Yeah. I have a big collection of it. I've given them my best, best pieces to my daughter because she cooks for her kids only in cast iron. Very nice. So make this a little bit bigger than your pan and you want it to be of an even thickness. Your oven should be preheated to the highest temperature. In this oven, 550, drape this into your pan. Should come up the sides a little. You don't want any of the filling to go underneath. And brush this with a little bit of olive oil and some Fontina cheese, grated. I love Fontina cheese, I love the flavor of it. It's a little stinky, <laughs> but it goes very well with mushrooms. Now, tell me that that doesn't look really good and smell really good. Okay. How do you keep your cast iron so clean? Because I know when I was growing up, it was extremely hard to keep it clean. I never quite understood it. So. Oh, oh, well, a well-seasoned pan stays cleaner than an unseasoned pan, first of all. And a seasoned pan is very smooth to the touch, doesn't have any roughness to it. I think this is good. And a little tiny bit more olive oil. And get that right into your oven. I only clean it with hot water and a brush and then dry it on top of the stove. And this goes right into your hot oven. Set your timer for 16 minutes. I think it's ready. See how nice it looks? Oh, wow. That looks looks really good. Now this could slide right out onto your board. Wow. That sound Ready to oh, nice. smells <laughs> so good. It looks perfect. Yeah, it's uh, almost a quiche pizza. And I would like to garnish this with just some fine tarragon leaves. You can just tear the leaves up and place them on top. Tarragon goes so nicely with mushrooms. If you don't have tarragon, you could put dill or parsley. Mm. The scent is amazing. Wild mushroom skillet pizza. So easy to make and so delicious to eat. So it's been very nice sharing with you these simple pizza recipes. I hope you try them at home. You'll never have to go to the local pizzeria again. Thanks so much for watching and thank you students for coming and visiting with me today. See you next time on Martha Bakes. Fit a pastry bag with a round tip. Place the bag tip down in a tall glass for support. Fold the top over into a cuff. Fill the bag using two separate pastry bags filled with contrasting colors. Twist the bag closed and begin applying pressure. This creates a soft serve look when piped into a swirl.